Before you can create a healthy relationship with others, you first have to create a healthy relationship with yourself. Welcome to Let's Talk About It with your host, Dr. Janie Lacey. Janie is a nationally respected psychotherapist, and on this show, she and her featured guests will help you discover and break patterns in your life that can contribute to self-sabotage and unhealthy relationships. Now, here is Dr. Janie Lacey. wondered why some businesses thrive while others take a nosedive or why some entrepreneurs are successful when many are not why do some businesses sell for maximum value some sell for pennies on the dollar and some don't even sell at all today our special guest Sharon Lecter is here to answer these questions Sharon co-authored the international bestseller, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and has released 14 other books in the Rich Dad series. Over 10 years as the co-founder and CEO, she led the Rich Dad company and brand into an international powerhouse. In 2008, she was asked by the Napoleon Hill Foundation to help re-energize the powerful teachings of Napoleon Hill, just as the international economy was faltering and has authored and co-authored multiple bestsellers, Think and Grow Rich in the Think and Go Rich series of books, including Three Free from Gold, Outwitting the Devil, Think and Grow Rich for Women, and Success and Something Greater. She's also featured in the 2017 movie, Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy, and in the 2020 television series, World's Greatest Motivators. Sharon provides invaluable insight from the top as both a mentor and an investor and built on the foundation of Exit Rich with her tremendous business and professional experience. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Well, thank you so much. I am so delighted to be with you. What a beautiful introduction. I appreciate it. And thank you for all you do to share this kind of information with your tribe. Well, we certainly are looking forward to it. And I have purchased 11 books. So for those that are watching, we are going to be doing a random drawing for five of those books. So if you are making your comments and liking behind the scenes and making your uh, reviews when um, this is released, we will go ahead and be doing a random drawing. So let's just kick it right into full gear, right out the gate, Sharon. Share with us why Exiting Rich matters. Well, for all of you that are starting a business or in a business, when you start it, do you expect to work it until the day you die? Or are you building it so that it's successful so that you can have a higher quality of life, you can impact more people, and eventually be able to like have more time to yourself. And so that's why you want to build with the exit in mind. How are you going to grow this business? How is it going to continue serving others? And too many business owners really own a job, not a business. And that's what I'm out here to change, to give them the tools and the resources for them to take a few steps early on to create this asset, my favorite word on earth, asset. It's a separate independent asset. Your business is generating income for you. And that's why we have you here, because especially this past year, with all the changes and how we do business and where we do business and where we were doing it, where it came from, all of that stuff came into question. And what I've also seen in that process where there are so many people who are now taking that entrepreneurial journey. And with all of your experience and knowledge, I mean, what would you say to that person who is listening or watching us and they're starting that entrepreneurial journey? What should they know? Well, you're absolutely right. The last year and a half, a lot of people realized that they weren't in control of their own life. Somebody else was. They were waiting for a paycheck and all of a sudden the paycheck stopped. And that's kind of a rude awakening. So a lot of people are starting into entrepreneurial journey, but be aware. If you want a successful business, it's really one of two things, solve a problem or serve a need. And if you're out there solving a problem and serving a need, then you've got a really good chance of, of a success. But you need to take the steps to build the systems around it. And don't try to do it alone. 
entrepreneurship can be very lonely. If you don't surround yourself with people that want you to be successful, if you don't find a mentor, a mentor is going to be, have been where you want to go. They can help steer you around the pitfalls. They can open doors. They can introduce you to the right people. And so really expand yourself. Sometimes people are afraid to ask for help because they don't want to show that they're needy. And I go, just reframe your mind and look at it as a, shot, a sign of respect for that mentor, showing, you know, sharing with them that they have success and wisdom that can help you in your journey. All a matter of perspective. It certainly is. And I wish I would have met you 15 years ago because, you know, everything that I am learning from you and all of your work, I realize all the mistakes I've made could have been prevented. <laughs> you know, and I think about, you know, that lonely journey, especially in the beginning of entrepreneurship. To your point, it seems so simple, but I don't know why I didn't do it because of what you just said. I needed to feel like I had it all together. So didn't ask for help, you know, because it was a, it is a true sacrifice in the sense of especially building a business and those that are building this business this past year are different businesses. It's sacrifice, it's time and attention. And I think sometimes what I'll see, especially with mentees is sometimes people want this microwave culture or even what I call it is picking other people's fruit and, you know, just picking this and picking that and, and wanting to get there pretty quick versus getting themselves grounded and getting a root system. And that's why I love Exit Rich because even the title reminds me of thinking with the end in mind. So with that being said, you know, what would you think about, you talk about in the book, which comes out for those that are watching uh, live on uh, June 22nd, is that correct? That is correct. We're very excited about it. A lot of push. Please um, get your copy, share it with your friends. June 22nd, available everywhere. But it really, we're so excited about the reception we've had. Steve Forbes uh, calls it a gold mine for entrepreneurs. And it's not just if you have a business owner, a, a business that you own, you may be investing in someone else's business, or you may be thinking of investing in a business. It's a great resource, a great tool for you to say, is this business something that I want to invest in. It gives you the questions to ask. So it's a huge and very important tool. And not just the book, but when we are purchasing, I know when I purchase it, there are all these different resources that we have gotten along with the book. And I'm um, looking forward to actually also visiting your ranch with some of my women's group in the future. But, you know, there's so many resources available to us. So when you talk about just creating those strategies on how to grow, and I know in my process, learning these terms, scalable and sellable business means for those that are on the entrepreneur journey, I mean, what does scalable and sellable business business even mean it's to the person who's working their business um in what happens is you get you start your business and you've got some success and you're so excited oh my gosh you're so excited but again we're taught to do everything on our own and so we, all of a sudden we find ourselves working in the business and we're not out there marketing it as much and it's very important if you're the only one working in your business it's very hard to grow and so when you start having that success you want to start looking at the people you have on your team make sure you have the processes the systems in your business how do you answer the phone how do you do customer service? How do you supply the product? How do you resource it? How do you get people to pay for, you, for it? How do you market? All those are systems. And you, you made the comment about the roots. You Think of a house. A house, you have to go down first to build a strong foundation. You have to put in the electrical system. You have to put in the plumbing system. And you can't have a functional house without those things. Same thing in a business. You have to have the systems. And so many times, I just, it just breaks my heart. Somebody has this incredible success. They hit a home run in sales and then they, then they implode because they've not built the systems to be able to meet the demand. And that's so important for you to build those systems and understand to have the right people on your team, the right mentor that can help you hit the ground running. And it's so many people today are not doing that. They're just trying to get money. They're chasing the dollar. Instead of chasing the dollar, let's inv invest your time in buying, building and creating the asset, the business that will generate the dollars. So let's break a couple things down that you said, I think it's very valuable. One, when you talk about the systems, so from answering the phone to how the client comes through the, the business, regardless of the business, one of the things that I'll see is having to document that process. So, you know, talk to us a little bit about, so when people are hearing, you know, the system, you know, a few practical tips that they can see and they can measure right now. Am I doing that? Am I creating systems in my business? What would be a couple of highlights that you can share with us? 
Well, let me tell you a story. Okay, you start a business and all of a sudden your sister-in-law wants to work with you. So she comes in and you create a job for her and your neighbor comes in to help you and you create a job for him. And all of a sudden your business isn't running efficiently because it's based on personalities. And that is not the way to create business systems. You want to say, how do I want this to work? Um, we talk, I talk about customer journey. Some people call it funnels for online businesses, but customer journey. How do they hear about you? How are you getting your word out there? What do they find when they find you, your website? How do you make that initial conversation? How do you nurture them? How do you sell something? How do you make what you're selling to them? How do you deliver it to them? How do you receive payment? All those, how do you have returns? Each one of those steps is a process that you can write down. And on top of it, a code of conduct. This is how I want my customers treated. And by doing that, then you have a standard system for all of your employees to understand and sign off on. Yeah, we got it. This is what we're, how we're going to treat our customers. This is how we're going to do it. And then you're managing a system, not a personality. It's so much easier because personality, when you say, hey, John, you know, we're supposed to do these seven things. And I see we got a, a couple of these were missed. What, what's, what's up? Okay, they're looking at the system, right? Instead of saying, John, you screwed up, a personal attack. And so in order to really build that foundation for your business, and once you've written it out, then somebody that lives in another state that wants to take your business and move it there, you've got it ready. You've got your, your systems documented that you can then duplicate. And that's the duplication means scalability. And then I also hear when you talk about hiring the right people that when you have those systems documented, if there is turnover, for example, you have it all laid out. So even from a practical training standpoint, you can bring in new people and you can have it laid out for them as you take their personality and who they are through the process versus the training process. I even learned that myself, you know, sometimes if we don't have those things documented, then it's just a lot of um, things that could be done differently to have more of effective training process. And it's possible it, because they can go back and relook at it. You don't have to be present. If you, for instance, I have a client that does um, the mandatory fire inspections for buildings and she's documenting the, the systems through video. Okay, this is what, well, this is what's acceptable. This is not, okay. This should not look this way. It should look this way. So that there's a documentation of what's acceptable to the company that an individual that's out in the field can really go back and refer to. So they're not having to call somebody, all right? So again, it gives you the ability to be stronger as a company, to be more consistent, all right? In order to grow, you need to have consistent culture. At the end of the day, the culture of your company is by design, all right? You put together this customer journey, your code of conduct, or by default, because you haven't paid attention to it and things just go willy-nilly. And those are the companies that may never sell because somebody comes in wanting to buy you and they go, this is a rat's nest. Nope, not interested. Creating a business that runs and system and it stands alongside you as a separate entity from you as the owner. So regardless of the business, like with Exit Rich is looking at all of these or having people think and consider all of their processes. So when they get to that place of either acquisition or someone that wants to buy them, they have all the right things to be able to, I think of negotiation. That's true. I mean, your business can be a hundred thousand dollar annual business, or it could be a hundred million. The processes and the information that we outline in Exit Rich, we talk about the six P's, your people. Do you have the right people? Do you have the right mentor? Do you have people who are strong where you are weak? We talk about your product, defining it. Maybe you have one product line that maybe you could probably have four. So let's look at that and see how you can add value to your company and additional revenue streams. Processes, those are the business systems we've just been talking about. And then the fourth one is proprietary. Most of the value of companies today, close to 90% of the value of companies out there, Fortune 500, are intangible. That means they're not on the books. It's that intellectual property 
the goodwill. You've heard the term goodwill. Well, that's the brand recognition, the value of the brand, your database, all of those things add value to your company. And it's, that's my superpower. I help people find those processes and those proprietary elements. What makes you competitive? What's your competitive advantage? That's value. Let's identify your intellectual property. Let's protect it and then leverage it. And we go through all of this within the book, Exit Rich. And then the fifth P is patrons, your people, your database. And in today's world where companies are all excited because they have a million followers on Instagram, Clubhouse, Facebook, LinkedIn, those are fantastic, but they're not yours. You need to be out there, yes, but they're lead gens. You wanna invite them home, nurture them home to your database. Many companies are sold simply for their databases. So make a, a way for them to easily come to you. Give them a report, give them a free gift, give them a free video. But in doing that, you get their name and email address that builds tremendous value in your company. And then the six P is profits. We all want to make profits, but most people focus on the product and the profit to the exclusion of the other four P's that are so important in creating a business that will be scalable and that will be saleable. Great. You make a great points that I want to emphasize. You know, one of the mentors who I'm learning from, John Lee, you know, he talked about, and he uses an example of, um, you know, a president that was taken off of a social media platform and all of their millions of followers went with that um, cutting off. So having that process to take them from a follower to, to your point to home. So thinking through the process that should be included is what I'm hearing is if you're using, especially today with so much social media is not just banking on that social media as um, your database, but taking that separately and off. Is well, a, John a Lee is a perfect example of that because he's got you know, well over 5 million followers among all his social media platforms, but he's always bringing you back to his database and doing his master classes, bringing you home. So he, all of this is very important and he's actively um, participating in all the social media, but he understands the value of bringing you into the community, into the family. Absolutely. Anyone that's been in earshot of him knows it's jl.club, <laughs> repetitive. But the, also the other thing that I heard you say with the intellectual property when we're looking at exit rich and, and all the processes is the how, if I make it very practical, the how they do things. And that's not the stuff that is tangible and that that's what I'm hearing you also say in that sense. And how important would you would you express to the new entrepreneurs about having I think, I think the terms are just would be non-competes, non-competes with their intellectual property, right? Because since there's potentially not a product, but it's a system, it's how we do things, how we do things better than the competitor. I can tend to think of a SWOT analysis. I mean, as a um, mentor in this field, is that something that you recommend to your entrepreneurs? Well, we take everybody through a process, an intellectual property checklist, because it's not just non-competes. It's really important to have non-disclosures with certain things. You might have um, trade secrets that you need to make sure maintain their secrecy. Um, you want to have copyrights, trademarks, patents, and all of those are very important, and they provide different types of protection. So you want to look at it. Sometimes you want to have all of them, and it's very important to look at it from a an expert's eyes as to what could be protected. And many people don't do that. And so for instance, if, if you come up with a process um, or an invention, okay, in the US, you only have one year from the date you'll first offer it for sale to patent it. And other countries even have different rules. So it's really important to, to really look at it early on because that gives you your competitive advantage. You know, patents are the strongest form of intellectual property protection there is. And so when you're looking at bringing in an investor or potentially selling the business, first thing is they would like to have a list of your intellectual property. And that is tremendous value to any company. And you all have it. You all have it, but have you identified it? Your database, all right? Your name, your logo, all of those are intellectual property. But have you taken the time to make sure your trademark is registered? Have you made sure you're not infringing someone else's trademark? Those are very important things, steps to take for a new business owner. And I think it's important that everyone hears that, that it's not just a black and white process. It depends on the business and the processes and what and all the all those things. So so great, great um comments. 
I want to pivot here is actually since we're talking about John Lee, he's always talking about this. But when we find that people have this uh, scarcity mentality, all right, or some people in, will use a poverty mentality, we interchange these words. But what I'll find is it's difficult for them to recognize that. But it can, if they don't recognize it, it can sabotage their success in business and entrepreneurship. So how can someone who's listening to us, Sharon, how can they recognize that they may be operating in a scarcity mentality and that can be sabotaging them from their success process? Well, the first step I take people through is ask them, you know, what did your parents say to you about money? Did they say things like money doesn't grow on trees? Um, we pinch your pennies, save for a rainy day. We can't afford it, my favorite. And when you say we can't afford it, it's negative. It closes your mind. You want to kind of get under the covers and turn off the lights. And so by doing that, you raise up in a, you're raised in an environment, money negative, money negative, money negative. No wonder we develop a scarcity mindset because we're not teaching it in school. That's one of my biggest soap pop issues. If we really want to level the playing field for every child to have opportunity, we would be teaching them about entrepreneurship and money in school. But that scarcity mindset is, causes you to never always be afraid you're never going to have enough money. And then when you actually start having some success, you're afraid you're going to lose it. And so you, every program I do, I work with what you need to do about your money and what you need to do about your attitude your mindset about money. It goes hand in hand because that changing and evolving that scarcity mindset into the mindset of abundance is essentially important if you're going to create long-standing success in your life. And once you actually look at it and realize where it came from, you can almost become humorous and say, you know, I tell young couples that are getting together to potentially get engaged, I go, go out and have a, a money date and talk about what your parents, how they felt about money. And usually ends up in laughter, but you can start seeing where it came from and start releasing it. And that's so important because so many times it's internally, it's subconscious, and we don't realize the control it has on us. So then in your experience, so someone's listening to you and they're like, oh my, that's me. I have a scarcity mentality. <laughs> so what could be some things that they can start to do to change um, in a practical sense immediately so they can start working on their mindset so that they can set themselves up for success? Well, the first thing is if you find yourself saying, I can't afford it, stop. That's scarcity. It closes your mind. And so retool your thought process from I can't afford it to how can I afford it? That simple change, that simple, just flip the switch, how can I afford it, opens your mind to the possibilities. It triggers your entrepreneurial spirit and you'll start getting creative. Now do that with your children and boy, will they get creative. They'll come up with all kinds of ways to get what they want instead of saying we can't afford it. And so that's what you want. You want to trigger that creativity. As little kids, our kids, you know, they build forts and castles out of pillows and blankets when they're little, all right? Then they go to school and they're, they're taught some conformity, which we need as we live with amongst each other. We have some conformity we need to live. But what happens, it becomes, it becomes the norm. We, get, we graduate, we get our career, we get comfortable, and we get, we get complacent, like driving to work and we don't really remember driving there because we do it every single day. Mm -hmm. And then there's a crisis. Let's talk about the last year and a half. There's a cry and our th lives are thrown into chaos. How do we get out of it? By becoming curious and creative again. So my recommendation to everyone is maintain your curiosity, your creativity for yourself and your children. And I always ask people, when was the last time you did something for the first time? When was the last time you did something for the first time? Because it means stepping outside your comfort zone, triggering your creativity, triggering your curiosity, and elevating your self-confidence in the process. So their language matters. And a few tweaks to change how they speak to themselves, which brings me right to that research that comes out of University of Cambridge that 69% of our thoughts automatically are negative. So we have to be aware of what we're thinking and how we say it and say it differently, but then also not be afraid to be creative. Because when I hear creativity, I also hear the word that comes to mind are people are fearful, right? As you're talking about stepping out and doing something for the first time. 
And that's also a mindset. So when you think about people, especially in the entrepreneur world, about bringing creativity, I mean, what would that mean to them in a practical sense so that it doesn't scare them? Well, I think dealing with the fear, and that's a whole nother subject we can talk about after the break, because um, I'm an expert in overcoming fear. And that's part of the important things for people to understand, because in today's world, fear of criticism is such a huge thing. And that is, you made a comment, what's greener on the other side, right? Looking at yourself in the eyes of other people. But no, you are uniquely you, you are perfect, just the way you're here, stand in your own power and learn how to become the best you there is. And that is challenging yourself to always be moving forward and trying new things and stepping outside that comfort zone. Because once you start taking action, when you are in action, it's hard to be fearful, right? And you want to move forward. When you're fearful, you want, you get paralyzed. Fear paralyzes us or motivates us. And most people are paralyzed by that fear. I want to help people turn that fear into energy. So take action for their future. I'm also hearing that being in the healing space is that people also have to heal from their childhood, their messages, the wounds, and all of that stuff plays into how we speak to ourselves, to the things that we are fearful. And um, when we do come from the break, I do want to go a little bit into, into the fear factor because I do think that that's a huge process. When I see what's happening right now, especially, and we'll get into this, the digital world of entrepreneurship, it's so easy for people to just do what other people are doing versus stepping out and creating that own unique path for themselves. And sometimes you can just almost see it. If someone does this, then all of a sudden it crops up for everybody's doing it. And I see that as something that's more deeply rooted versus just um, uh, an easier exit, so to speak, to get to the lay, the lay of the land of entrepreneurship. So, you know, it's great, great conversation. And we are just so honored to have the Sharon Lecter with us. And she's talking about her new book, Exit Rich, that we all need a copy and many other copies for our friends and family, because there's no reason for no one to be successful in their journey of entrepreneurship. So we'll be right back after this break. Let's talk about it with Janie Lacey. Are you often attracted to unavailable partners? Feel like you can't stay but can't leave a toxic relationship? Obsessed with thinking about a current or former lover? Feel resentful that you're always taking care of the other person? The Woman Redeemed Therapy Program is for women who want to break free from toxic relationship patterns so they can find the love they truly deserve. This program is a safe, nurturing environment, essential for building self-worth and acquiring the tools to work through challenges and create your best self. We invite you to begin the journey today to start building the new you. Call 407-622-1770 or visit LifeCounselingSolutions.com. That's LifeCounselingSolutions.com. You are listening to Let's Talk About It with Dr. Janie Lacey. To reach the show today, please call into 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. You may also send an email to Janie at lifecounselingsolutions.com. Now back to Let's Talk About It. with Janie Lacey. We are here with Sharon Lecter, and we're discussing her new book, Exit Rich. Welcome back to the show, Sharon. Oh, I'm so delighted to be with you. Thank you. I love your questions. They're very insightful. So you were talking a little bit about fear before we went to our uh, commercial break. Talk to us a little bit about how people can identify. I always think about in in terms of steps, their first step and how they can identify that they're operating from a place of fear versus that place of creativity and exploration. What are some of the the nuggets that you can share with our audience? Well, absolutely. And in fact, I have a book called Outwitting the Devil, which is all about overcoming fear. And as part of the Napoleon Hill Foundation um, offerings of books, and it was actually hidden away for 72 years because Napoleon Hill actually wrote the original manuscript the year he released Think and Grow Rich because he was frustrated because he said, even though people know what they're supposed to do, they don't do it. Does anybody feel related to that? Yeah, me too. 
And so he wrote the book and the title scared his wife to death. So it got locked away for 72 years. And in it, he talks about how he takes on every taboo in our society, sex, politics, religion, education, alcohol, cigarettes, even before the world knew cigarettes were bad for us. And he, he frames the book as an interrogation of the devil. And he says, you can believe I'm talking to the real devil or an imaginary devil. Will you derive any benefit from what I share? And in it, we talk about the different types of fear, right? Fear of poverty, fear of old age, fear of loss of love, fear of criticism, as I said, is which I think is really pervasive in the world we live in today. And it's really eye-opening to see where those fears come from. For instance, in religion, he says, did you, did you learn your religion through fear or faith? No, I was raised in Southern Baptist Church. That one hit me right between the eyes because my minister on Sunday from the pulpit was totally fear-based. You know, I, I just knew I was head, heading to hell, right? And yet the youth minister was all about the love of God, the love of Jesus. So he was teaching it through faith. So what's an incredible example to me to understand how are we filling our lives? Are we fearful or are we faithful? And when you're fearful, you're looking down. It's like you've got blinders on. You miss opportunities. When you can adjust that to living in faith, with faith, your, op your eyes are up and you're open and you see those opportunities right in front of you. And so in the book, he talks about how to overcome that fear, definiteness of purpose, what are you doing? What do you want to accomplish? Who do you want to be? What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, understanding your definiteness of purpose gets you through a lot of, dis of, of discontent and fear and inaction. Learning from adversity. We, things happen to us, bad things. But we wouldn't be who we are today if we hadn't had those experiences. So when people make a mistake, a lot of times they define themselves as a failure. I go, no, a mistake is an occurrence something that happened. It's not a definition of who you are. It's a learning opportunity. And then mastery over yourself, self-discipline. Some people roll their eyes, but you know, if we want something in life, we have to have our discipline to be able to achieve it. And then controlling your environment, particularly in the last year and a half. Where have you been hanging out? Who have you been listening to? You, have you been in the crowd that changed day pajamas to night pajamas? Are you in the crowd that's been binge watching Netflix? Or are you in the crowd that has used this time to fill their mind with new excitement, new opportunities, readjust their business, get ready to come back out of the gate because they've taken and invested that time? So are you investing your time or spending your time? And that's a, another element that he shares. And that is so pertinent. Because when we just spend our time, we don't get it back. Time's our only precious resource. We can make money, lose money, and get it back. But when time's gone, it's gone. And so invest your time in creating the future that you deserve. And understand that as you have that definiteness of purpose, there's not room for fear. Because you know you're on a mission. You know what you're doing. You're solving a problem or serving a need. And I just, I just love the book. It's just really helped us bring the teachings of Napoleon Hill to the younger generation. And it's all about identifying where that negativity is coming from and how we're allowing it to paralyze us and keep us from achieving the success that we deserve. I'm just over here uh, smiling for, for many reasons. And one, I had a reminder um, this past week, I was having a conversation with Les Brown. And we we're talking about relationships, but he, you know, you talk about criticism. He will say the truth just as you do. And he said, you know, this past year, the amount of time it took some women to learn how to twerk, they could have read a book. <laughs> and I mean, everyone just really laughed, but they knew that there was some truth there. But you mentioned about outwitting the devil. And there was a part, I'm going to pivot here a little bit. There was a part in the book that really just had me deeply thinking. And you kind of started talking about it earlier. My son is uh, nine, he's a lot younger in this picture, but he's nine, he's going into fourth grade. And in the book, when you're talking about the school system, I you know, won't get into it, we'll let everyone read it. But when, I, when you're talking about that, it just really made me think and shift my mindset. And I was looking at things a lot different and I can see very clearly some things. But when we talk about just the mindset when it comes to money and setting up, children for success. I mean, what do you feel like are things that people that are listening to that they have this urge to want to teach 
financial literacy in schools. I mean, what can we all do to start maybe pushing that so that we can set up our children for success or at least have different conversations about it? Well, thank you. One of my favorite topics. Um, as a parent, an aunt, uncle, or a concerned adult, you need to realize that we want our kids to have everything we didn't. The problem is we become an enabler instead of a mentor. So focus on everything you can to become a mentor. Instead of doing things for our children, teach them how to do it for themselves. And in this world of instant gratification, it's harder and harder for children to have the self-confidence they desire. So get them to say, if they want something, again, don't say we can't afford it. Say, Mary, you want this? How, how are you going to earn the money to get it? And she's going to get so creative about ways to get that money and let her set a goal, let her earn it, celebrate with her, let her buy what she wants. And you're going to see in that process that self-confidence grow because she did it on her own. And so that's how you can become a mentor instead of an enabler. And it's so important with our kids today because there's such an increase in, uh, in suicide rates. There's such a decrease in self-confidence. And it's because they're not standing in their own power. So allow your children to understand that they are uniquely perfect just the way they are. And the fact that they see their friends out somewhere on Facebook or TikTok or Instagram, and all of a sudden they feel less, elevate them and understand that they are perfect and that they have every opportunity to create the life that they deserve. So and keep them, keep them curious, keep them curious. So essentially I'm also hearing in, in that, Sharon, is that we have to also have that for ourselves so that we can give to them what we have. So if we are building up our self-confidence and we have a different language, then the flow down to our next generation and hopefully generations after generation will be very different. Yeah, in my book, Three Feet from Goal, which was the first book that I did with the Napoleon Hill Foundation back, we released it in 2009. We talk about the personal success equation and you can get it at personalsuccessequation.com. But it talks about your passion and your talent. All right, so my passion came from anger. I was mad we weren't teaching kids about money in school. My talent, longtime CPA, lots of publishing experience. And so I could combine that. But most of us stop there. We think we have to do it on our own. But true success comes by times A, power of association. How having the right people on your team, having the right mentor. And then times A, taking action. How many times we do, we just sit back and let the world, re we become reactive instead of proactive. And then plus F for faith and faith in yourself, faith in what you're doing, faith that it's needed and necessary, and faith that you will succeed. And I use this formula in every talk and in every client. We assess where they need to work on first. And it's usually the power of association. They haven't got the right people around them. They don't have the right mentor and self-confidence, that faith instead of faith is fear. And so what happens is they go hand in hand. When you have the right people around you, you have the right masterminds, you have the right people on your team, you have the right mentor. When you have a bad day, they lift you up and keep that confidence going. And so, yes, your self-confidence is a direct result of knowing that you're in your lane, that you're making a difference and you have the right people around you that are cheering you on, not trying to pull you back. I think that's such an important element. I know I certainly learned that the hard way, especially in business, sometimes people that were not serving the mission of the company and you see things, but when you're not in a place of taking care of yourself, you're not in a place of to be able to address the people, places, and things around you. But you mentioned uh, Three Feet from Goal, and I had the honor to interview your co-author, Greg Reed, a few years ago. So, you know, today someone's listening to us, Sharon, and they're aware that they have obstacles as an entrepreneur. You know, they, they became, as you mentioned earlier, they're now doing a job, even though that they have a business. And how can someone start working to their way to get out of that? I mean, what are some practical steps that they can do today to turn those obstacles into opportunities as you talk about in Three Feet from Gold? Well, every, every obstacle creates intellectual property because you figure out how to get around it. And that makes, gives you unique competitive advantage. So every obstacle, you know, we aren't where we are if we haven't had mistakes along the way. And so those obstacles become learning opportunities. And it's very important for you not to allow them to hold you back. 
perseverance is a very important part of three feet from gold. That's the whole essence of the story. Three feet from gold. Are you going to give up? So many people give up before the miracle happens. And so we talk about having that confidence in yourself and having people around you that are going to guide you. Right. In the last year and a half, I've heard the word pivot a lot. And I go, you're not pivoting if you know what you want to do. You're adjusting and adapting. So for instance, if you're a sailor and you want to sail to the Catalina Island and the wind shifts, you just adjust your sails. You still want to go to Catalina Island. And so in your business, you have a definiteness of purpose. You have things you want to accomplish. Well, what's happened in the last year and a half with everybody not being able to travel, being at home, we had to adjust and adapt how we did that, but it didn't change what we wanted to deliver. And so, yes, some people had to pivot. Some people had to leave one field and go into another. But that's, when, that's what pivot is. We want you to just adjust, adapt, and recalibrate and refire based on the new circumstances as the world has changed. And I also hear this probably be a great opportunity if someone realizes that they have a business, but they are the business to get a mentor, right? To figure out ways whether, and I always mention that if you can't, um, you know, be in a place where you have someone easily accessible to, you can pick up books, you know, you can start figuring things out uh, with the resources that you have available to you. That's so true. And I think it's important to be open a lot of people end up stalling in their business because they've stopped expanding to other networks. They've stopped expanding to other associations. And if you can always challenge yourself to go to new groups, it gives you that inspiration. You get inspired by learning what they're doing. That's part of that curiosity and creativity thing. And that's what keeps you propelling your business forward. What happens is we get all excited and we get out there and then we kind of get comfortable and we stop doing that pushing to new areas and new elements. And that's where it's so important to have that power of association, having the right people out there that introduce you to their communities so they can support you just like you're doing with me. I so appreciate this association that you and I have now because it allows me to serve your community. It allows you to take my information and share it with your community. And at the end of the day, everybody wins because I want to add value. That's my greatest goal is to add value to people's lives each and every single day. Absolutely. And as I mentioned earlier, looking forward to coming out to that ranch. <laughs> but you know, I also find Sharon that one of the most challenging jobs that we'll ever have, as we mentioned earlier, just talking about schools, you know, at least I feel is raising another human to set them up to navigate this very different world and constantly changing world as we should be. But can you share with us from your own teachings that we were over listening or overhearing your conversations with your own children as they were growing up? I mean, what were some of those lessons that you shared? And I um, am aware that you've lost the son. And I would love to hear about your, your son who received his wings. Well, thank you. Um, I think the biggest thing is I, I, I remember one day my oldest son called me and he'd been, he was at a um, shopping mall with, a, with his buddy. I um, mean, it was on the Indian reservation and the, the, his buddy was driving. They had an accident or nobody was hurt, but um, you know, they had to wait for the tribal police to come and and so I thought, you know, this is a teaching moment. So when he came home, I, you know, I said, well, honey, what would happen if you were driving? What would you do? And he said, I'd call you. And I'm going, okay, well, yes, I would want you to call me, but I also want you to know what you should do on your own. So let's have this conversation. And so, you know, challenge yourself as to, you know, are you doing too much for your children? And the best thing you can do is teach them how to do things on their own and how to support each other. One of the greatest um, compliments I've had around my children is their friends come over and they say, oh, I didn't know you guys, your parents had money. You know, it's like, okay, that's good. They've got their humble, they're there. And, and they're such good people here. I mean, that's that, the biggest thing is, is, is realizing that your greatest contribution and your greatest gift is that that you give others, not that you keep for yourself. And so it's a huge um, compliment to, to my children. I'm so proud of them. They're fantastic. They're incredible young people. And yes, I lost my son eight and a half years ago, and I don't wish that on anybody. We're not supposed to outlive our children, and it's devastating. In fact, it sent me what I call into my world of numb, being living life in neutral for several years. And that's why I'm so passionate about what I do today. A lot of people starting to get a complex are asking me, why do you still do this? You could retire. Yeah, I could have retired a long time ago. But 
when I made that decision about five years ago, thinking about retiring, I got a lot of pushback from family and friends, but I also heard my son in my ear say, get over it, mom, there's more for you to do. And today with what's happened the last year and a half, so many of your listeners and your viewers, you've had something that stopped you in your tracks. Could have been a death, could have been a divorce, a financial setback, an illness, an accident. And it's hard to, you have to go through that grief. I mean, my grief will not all ever be gone, but you're still here for a reason. And that's exactly what I realized. I'm still here for a reason. And I can choose to stay in the world of numb, or I can choose to play a bigger game again. And most of my career I played very big. I was with Disney. I was working for the presidents. And yet um, I had gotten to the point where I was just numb, playing very small. And once I made that decision to play big again, I said, I really want to invite people to come along with me. So I launched a private Facebook group called the Play Big Movement with Sharon Lecter. We don't advertise it. It's completely organic. It's people dedicated to playing a bigger game. I want you to be number one in your field. You're already an expert because nobody's had your successes or your learning opportunities. So I want you to go from an expert to the expert and then to become the authority. So be number one in your field, live your legacy because your legacy is cre created every single day with every heart you touch and create maximum impact. And when I made that decision to get back out and play a bigger game again and share it with other people, that's when I got the phone call from the Think and Grow Rich Legacy movie. That's when I got the phone call to be in the world's greatest motivators television series. Those opportunities were there, but I wasn't making myself open to them. And so I want all of you to play a bigger game. I hear Sharon living a life where she's in service. It's everything that she has is she's emptying it out to be in service to, to other people. It's a living legacy as I hear you walking that out. Thank you. It's my goal. My, uh, I have a young gal that works with me. She's been with working together for 21 years. I hired her as an intern out of college and she did a, one of those, a magazine cover mock-ups for me mm -hmm. and it had my name and she says a legacy of creating legacies. Mm -hmm. And I just love that because it is my greatest joy is helping other people create their legacy. So well, she described you perfectly. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, I want to hear your wisdom and knowledge on the space of um, relationships. You know, I heard in um, one of the talks I was listening to with Kevin earlier, I mean, he talks about entrepreneurship and he shared, you know, what he believes is one of the hardest truths about entrepreneurs is the most important decisions that we ever make, especially being in a global competitive world more than ever, is the person who we decide to be in relationship with, especially on the journey of entrepreneurship. So with the many entrepreneurs and business owners, I mean, how have you seen this play out? How their personal life and probably not having maybe a supportive partner affected their success within business or vice versa? Well, it's very, very important to have my husband and I in September will celebrate 41 years of marriage. And people ask me about, you know, the secret to success. And it's really having a high level of respect for each other as well as love. Because there are days when you get the love is hard to find, but the respect is always there. And it's really important to, to have that level and have that open line of communication. When one partner is a risk taker entrepreneur and the other one is risk averse, it's tough. So there has to be continued dialogue and conversation about what the United goals are, have a vision together for the family, for the future. And it is tough. I mean, you, it's hard to focus on building something for the future when you are struggling at home and it's, it's a, you go home to a war zone. So it's very important to have supportive people around you. And it's not just in your personal relationship, it's also in the business relationships. If you want your business to grow, that power of association is so important. One bad association can tarnish you and your brand forever. And so whether it's your personal life or your business life, make sure that the people that you surround yourself believe in you, believe in what you're doing, and are there to support you, not pull you back. So it matters and they're either going to be an anchor or an engine to your life is the way that I would sum, sum that up. But we think about you, we kind of talked a little bit earlier about it, but with this whole social media world and especially 
how people have done business and entrepreneurship has really looked different. I mean, there's no way around it when it comes to how many followers you have, you know, the rise of the creator economy and being able to create that influencer image to sell brands. And so many people are doing courses and memberships, creating all these online businesses. But when it comes to making money or in particular, you talk about assets a lot. I mean, how does someone who wants to exit rich and build assets, how does that play into the big picture, this online market? Well, I think it's very important because what happens is when you're talking about influencers, all right, you have a business brand that can be you, you know, a business can be a celebrity brand or a mission brand. And when I work with my clients that want to be celebrities, we encourage them to do both side by side because somebody can buy a mission brand, a business, but they can't buy you. And so many people build their business around their own personality and you can never sell it. You're, you're kind of tied to it forever. And so be very clear on what you want. Be clear on the exit when you get started. Build the celebrity brand, but also have that business brand that is something that could potentially scale and be sold. And in today's world of social media, clubhouse, you know, you, everybody becomes a pers personality much more so than they, they did five years ago. And so it's really important to utilize that in stable, stabilizing, being, in, instead of being the brand, be a spokesperson for the brand. That's my guidance to people. You can be a spokesperson for the brand, not be the brand. To create that separation. So since we're on the topic of, of assets, just in general, what would be some, in your experience with people who build wealth, when you look back, how does assets show up? You know, I know in, in previous conversations with you, I've heard you say about real estate. I mean, so when people think in terms of asset, I mean, where would you direct our minds to? Well, certainly there's lots of different, there's probably dozens of types of assets, but I talk about four main areas. One is businesses where you own the business. You have other people's money, time, and resources working for you in that business. And then there's real estate where you own the real estate, but your tenants pay you rent and it covers the expenses and you get positive cash flow. And most wealthy people around the world have either made their money in real estate or they hold their wealth in real estate. And so it's, and when you talk about diversification of assets, it's all these categories. And the third one is your paper assets, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and the equities. That's very important to understand that you have that ability to have all those types of assets. And the fourth one is um, intellectual property. What can you create? What can you take what you know and share it with people in a tangible form that makes you money? And all of those are opportunities. I want you to have multiple streams of income. And there, of course, there's collectibles. They don't generate cash flow, but you want them to appreciate. And that's you know another big area for a lot of people that have art or jewelry, but it's something that if you need the cash flow, that's not going to help sustain you because you're financially free when the income from your assets exceeds your monthly expenses. And it doesn't have to be millions of dollars. So income from your assets exceed your monthly expenses. That means your assets are working for you and are creating the lifestyle you choose. I also hear passive incomes, making money while you're sleeping. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So a couple of them, um, as we, we wind up on today's episode, a couple of things, what can you share with us in your teachings about financial literacy, the greatest lessons that people need to understand around business and taxes in particular, which I commonly hear is a big one. Well, the first step is to understand a lot of people put their head in the sand and they don't really analyze where they are financially. And so the first thing is figure out where you are. You know, my dad said a map doesn't do you any good if you don't know where you are and where you're going. So where are you financially? The picture might be bleak, but at least you'll know where you are. You can start charting a course to get to where you want to. Always think of the asset, not the income. Don't chase the income. Invest your time in buying and building and creating the asset that will become the income generator for you. Good advice. So as we get ready to wrap up, what's next for Sharon Lecter? As we follow you and support you, what's next for her? Well, thank you. I'm working on a couple of different interesting things that I'll be releasing shortly, but I'm really moving into an area of trying to provide that daily kind of positivity. I have a daily message as ATM, kind of a play on ATM deposits at a bank. 
abundance tips and mentorship. You go to atm.sharonlector if you want to find out more. Because when this pandemic started, I was just, I was mad at all the negativity around the world. And I said, I, we need, I need to counteract this negativity. So I started this and I really love it because I'm every single day pouring into people, getting their day started off right to think about abundance and mentorship and really choosing the life you deserve and receiving and achieving the success that you deserve. Well, we certainly will be sharing all of your links um, on our behind the scenes and all the episodes that come out. Well, we certainly appreciate your time, your mentorship, your knowledge, your expertise, and your presence and your character and just being you, Sharon. We appreciate you. you. Thank you. You know, so in closing, a quote from one of my favorite humans, Oprah Winfrey. It was never about obtaining wealth or celebrity. It was about the process of continually seeking to be better, to challenge myself to pursue excellence on every level. So what are you gonna do differently after today's conversation to pursue your excellence and exit rich? Until next time, this is your host, Janie Lacey. Thank you for tuning in. Let's Talk About It can be heard live every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Time and 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Please join your host, Dr. Janie Lacey, for another edition of the show next week.